this is Stacy Spriggs with UFI Phys Extension, Sarasota County. Thank you for joining us today for a short video on how to put your garden to bed properly. Here in Sarasota County, we have lots of community garden members who are seasonal residents. They go out of town for uh, usually four or five months there over the summer. And because of that, we need to make sure that the plots are properly covered before you go away. And if not, then you need to designate a, a secondary member to help take care of that space while you're gone. We also have 64 uh, school gardens currently in Sarasota County, and this video is offered to help our local teachers understand how to quickly and efficiently cover their spaces so that you don't come back to that weed infested mess at the end of the summer break. So we're going to start off today with a crew from Culver House Community Garden who will demonstrate to us how to cover their plot with affordable materials. The first thing we do out here in uh, Culver House Community Garden is uh, weed the plot. If we don't weed the plot entirely, it's useless to try and cover it. The weeds will grow through newspaper, they'll grow through straw, they'll grow through a weed barrier, they'll go through just about anything. So the very first thing to do to prepare your plot for going away for the summer is to make sure every single weed is out. Uh, one of the uh, gardeners asked me, should they amend their soil before they do this? And I would recommend not. Because of so much rain and the water table coming up, you're gonna lose them, it's gonna wash through with the sand. So. I tell people, don't amend your soil, just turn it over, get all the weeds out, and then start your processes. The first thing uh, we do, one of, the, one of the most successful ones is cardboard. And we collect refrigerator boxes and various things. Here's a box <coughs> someone gave us to start for the demo. <coughs> One of the important things is to overlap. All our plots are marked with lines with these um, with these uh, cylinders, and so you can tell exactly where your plot ends. And the most successful gardeners make sure that they come out onto the path. So you could set your box like this. The next one would overlap. Everything is overlapping. I don't have enough big cardboard to show you that, second, but this is what you would do. You would overlap it by at least six inches. So here's the setup. Now we spread straw. What we have, this is called coastal hay. It's available at uh, two places in Sarasota. Um, it's not really a hay, it's a straw. And the difference is, this is this you don't feed to animals. There's no seeds in here. Because there are no seeds, it should not cause weeds to grow in your plot. The technique here is not to put one here and one here, but to actually shred this to form an interlacing mat. What happens is as the rain falls on it, <clears throat> if you make sure this is all broken up and interlaced, it'll form through the summer rains almost like a felt. And you bring it right out to about here and hopefully the only weeds you're going to find that you have to take care of during the summer are around the edge. Sort of look like Ben Franklin with little hairs coming out the side. But this is a method for cardboard with straw. Um, it doesn't really matter how much you put on here as long as you feel there's a thick interwoven, not just clunks, but straw that's all interwoven like this and it'll mesh. So this would be the cardboard method. Second method we use, which is quite successful, particularly you'll see some of these beds are boarded. And this works really well with them, and that's to get weed barrier. And you can staple it. You can staple it right to the side of your plot, and thus you could go like this. Right here and just put staples. On a plot that has no borders, you want to, well, this is a nice long one. You can go longwise. You can cut it however you like. I like to use a commercial grade, fairly good stiff grade, because otherwise the weeds grow right through. Again, come out onto the path. So you put this down in this fashion, and the next strip would be overlapped by about this much. Again, 
The same thing with the straw. When we first did this out here, we used to put these in blocks and we used to look called tile it. And then we discovered that the weeds would come right up through there, anywhere the sunlight can get down. One of the things that's different about this versus cardboard is you get more water penetrating this. So it's a little less effective because weeds love water. Again, you sh shred this out, making sure you don't have any uh, seams. Again, it forms a mat. The third method, which I prefer, is newspaper because I'm out here and I can get the few weeds. If you go away thinking, boom, that's it, I'm going for five months, that'll be great, it doesn't work. Weeds come up anyway. This one is the best barrier, but when you're finished in the fall, you have to haul this away. It's rotten, it's gooey, it's matted, it's heavy, but it won't compose in our compost piles. So we ask people if they do this, to be prepared to bring garbage bags and take it <coughs> for curbside pickup. People like this and they like newspapers because we're recycling. This stuff, the weed barrier, if you don't have too many weeds coming up through it, you can reuse it each year. This is more expensive. This is affordable. This is very affordable. So <coughs> toward the end of the summer season, we ask people to collect newspapers and we put it in a bin here out at the garden. Newspapers have to be tiled very thick in this fashion, overlapped all the time. Four, five, six layers, depending on how much newspaper you have. Overlapping them all. Unfortunately, it's windy here in the spring. So what happens is, these start flying around, so you can't do too much newspaper at a time. But what you do is you do a little bit and then you spread your straw. And again, on this method, you use a little bit more straw than on cardboard, obviously. Um, the thing that's nice about newspaper is currently, I believe, the printing ink they use in newsprint is biodegradable, it's vegetable based, but on cardboard, I don't think it is. And we had a, somebody research that and said, cardboard may not be the best thing for the soil. If you get these boxes that don't have a lot of print on them, I think we're safe. We are organic, so you wanna be sure to use things that don't poison the soil. <clears throat> so these are the three methods we use, cardboard, especially if you can get clean cardboard, not too much print on it. Weed barrier, which is gonna cost you something and does not last, does not hold the weeds at bay as long as cardboard. Newspaper, which is the most inexpensive of all, cheapest of all, <laughs> recyclable. And it's good if you're gonna be here during the summer or you're only go away for two months because you can tidy up around them. <clears throat> All three methods, you bring it out over the edge. Paths, there's nothing you can do about it. So we ask all gardeners, even if they go away for several months, they need somebody to back them up on the weeds that grow around their plot, because this is a 12-month operation. So this works for us out here. And uh, as I said, the heavier grade, the better you'll do here, and you can always reuse it. So those are our three methods. Get every weed out, don't amend your soil, collect your materials, make sure every weed is out again, and then pick your method. Straws available, we have someone who actually does a big order for us and they deliver it. Another method for uh, covering over your garden in the summer is a solarization process. Uh, the key benefit of this technique is really uh, to be able to kill uh, things like nematodes in the garden soil. Uh, it will also, uh, due to its sterilization effect, due to the heating up that occurs with solarization, it will also kill uh, weed seeds and other things in your garden bed. Um, at Culver House, we don't typically use solarization as a technique, 
Uh, the reason for that is that um, uh, we get some summer rains here pretty heavy that flood this garden and that typically takes care of the nematode problem for us. But with other people, the solarization in home gardens or whatever could be really quite helpful. Um, uh, the technique is uh, uh, taking a piece of plastic and basically, and the plastic needs to be clear plastic, not black plastic. You want the sunlight to penetrate through the, the plastic and heat the soil up to a point that it kills, solarizes the nematodes or seeds that are in the soil. So the technique is typically to staple plastic around your raised bed like we have over here. Um, no straw would go on top of it. You want it totally open to the sunshine. And, um, uh, or in a garden bed like this, uh, using um, uh, wire uh, uh, ties that you can put down like with weed barrier or something like that uh, around the edges to hold the plastic down is the technique that would be used. This is a piece of material that has been successfully used by a gardener here last summer. It is similar to a tarp. Um, it can be purchased at big box stores for approximately 15 cents a square foot, but it has some advantages to a tarp. Um, it, it, whatever the material is, it feels like there may be some polyester and it, it doesn't seem to deteriorate. This is two years old at this point. Um, it also has an advantage that when it's pulled taut over the garden bed that water cannot pool over it and therefore breeding mosquitoes. Another advantage of uh, using this material over say plastic uh, is it won't tear when you use uh, garden staples to hold the material in place. Uh, garden staples being preferred by the county over using bricks or cement blocks because they're not a projectile hazard during uh, hurricanes or storms. Uh, to install a staple, you just take the staple, put it where you want it, give it a little push, push it down, and it'll hold the material in place and allow, allow you to stretch it out on the other end and pull it tight. As far as overlapping, if you were laying this out in the garden and wanting to get a good um, cover, the best method would be, and you can see this gardener did it by the, the different um, lines here. He overlapped four to six inches, running his next piece approximately in six inches and would have gone down through the gardens that way using using these staples to hold them in place. Hi, these are velvet bean seeds in my hand and they're actually really kind of beautiful to me. They're mottled in color and approximately four years ago I grew my first cover crop using velvet beans. I had tried sweet potatoes but found that they didn't really um, cover as I had hoped and then I tried watermelons and they didn't cover as I'd hoped and I was interested in finding something that I could use for a cover crop here in Florida that would be a sustainable uh, and possibly nitrogen fixing crop. These are nitrogen fixing and so for four years I've been growing these each summer and um, they grow, I guess, like Topsy, according to some people, and I guess we have photos to show that too. They will, you can plant them in the spring. You can even plant them amongst things you've got going while you're busy clearing out the garden. I tend to plant them around May, and I think last year I purchased a pound and maybe used a quarter of a pound for my 10 by 40 garden and the cost for the beans was approximately $20 off the internet. Uh, I'm really pleased with them. When it comes fall, you, you come back to the garden. In the meantime, the only work I know is to water them occasionally as they get started in the spring. And in the fall then, you can either till them back into the soil or you can pull them and put them in a compost pile. I also um, have started using velvet beans this past year, and um, I tried getting a little closer to what the USDA recommended production crop uh, seed planting level was, and that was way too much. A uh, quarter pound uh, for a 
my 17 by 32 plot would have been more than enough. Uh, if you plant one seed every two feet by two feet, that should be sufficient. Uh, I started planting my crop when I was about a month from the end of, of all my harvesting. I knew I'd be coming to the garden regularly, so I knew I'd be watering every day or every other day. So I got the seeds going, and as long as you can get the, the seeds to a point where they start to vine, then they're pretty self-sufficient and have deep enough roots where they'll be able to grow themselves without routine watering. Uh, when they start out in the beginning, they look like just regular um, kind of bush beans, but then eventually you'll see they start growing long and viney. Um, I have a couple of uh, sets of seeds from last year. The, these are what they look like by the time they're dry. Um, this is, and it only has one seed in this one, this is still a growing bean pod, and it has one bean in it, and you probably can't tell, but there's some brown hair on these things, and the brown hair can be an irritant to some people. Um, I did not have an issue with this, but other gardeners in the garden did have a problem with it. Uh, so just wear a pair of gloves and it should not be an issue. When you go to remove the vines, and keep in mind these vines can grow 20, 30 feet long. When you go to pull the vines, you'll probably get some sap on you. And the sap will turn your hands brown, it'll get spots all over your clothes, and no matter how much you bleach it, you're not getting those spots out. So just make sure to wear something that you don't care about. Um, to get it off my hands, I, I use straight, straight bleach and then wash my hands with soap and water right away. Um, the, the beans, besides being a natural nitrogen fixer, they're also a natural nematodicide. So they'll you know, help not only control weeds in your garden, but they'll also control nematodes. And the USDA recommends planting them on some sort of fence or structure they even mention planting them along with your corn as a vertical support. The theory being that the pollinators come into the plants from the side and to pollinate the flowers, and if you don't have vertical support, you're not gonna get a lot of pollination. Well, just growing it flat on the ground, you'll get enough beans that you won't need to buy beans for next year. Um, if you do plant on anything vertical, like your tomato baskets, or fencing that you have for beans or peas, it's gonna be a nightmare to remove this stuff. It's a vine that wraps and, and spins its way around everything, and it's just a nuisance to unwrap it. So I would recommend getting all your baskets and, and fencing out of the garden before you plant. Uh, the vines can be, since they are viney, they do tend to run into various areas, but they do respect other gardens next to you if they are tarped or plastic. They'll, they'll, without your assistance, they'll see that tarp and they'll stop right there. I hope you've learned a lot today about how to cover your plot appropriately for the summer months. So no matter whether you choose to use those different materials, this cardboard and coastal hay or a cover crop or other materials, any of those choices are great for you to avoid the mess that comes with cleaning up your plot at the end of the summer. So unless you wanna come back to that weed infested mess and pulling weeds for hours on end in the summer heat, please take a few minutes at the beginning of the summer to cover your plot appropriately. And just a quick disclaimer, if you're viewing this video from elsewhere in the country, this video was made for local conditions here in Sarasota County for our community and school gardens program. If you're somewhere else in the country and you're viewing this online, please contact your local Extension office for their advice. And thank you for watching.